Oak House Church brings to you the word of life, which is able to build you up and offer you an inheritance among all those that are sanctified. Sit back and listen, and may your life become more like that of Christ as you encounter His Word. God bless you. Glory to your name. We give praise, glory, and honor with thanksgiving unto you for who you are and for what you represent. You are the God of the whole universe, the maker of heavens and the earth. We bless you. We bless your holy name. We adore you. We thank you, God, for again another opportunity to be in your presence in Zion. You say that they that appear in Zion, they grow from strength to strength. We are here again to draw from you. We are here again tonight to hear you speak the word of life, the word, the very word of God that is able to build and build us and of us our inheritance among them that are sanctified. Thank you, Lord. We pray that you act, that you open our eyes tonight. Grant us understanding of your word. We also ask for the grace, not just to be the hearer, but also the doer. So that in every area of our lives, you will be glorified. And whatsoever we lay our hands to do shall be blessed. Thank you, Father. We surrender again and commit this meeting into your hands, Holy Spirit, to guide and direct and lead us all the way. Jesus precious name we pray and amen God bless you God bless you power and might be unto the Lord for Please, um, when we share the grace, all our pastors, every deacon and uh, deaconess in the church should wait behind. The moment we share the grace in the fellowship. <coughs> Excuse me. Amen. We're going to read today, uh, look at something that is... Um, Not common. And um, okay, so Matthew chapter 5, let's look at verse 1. And so Jesus Christ is the one is being reported about. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he set, when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And when Jesus saw the multitude, he went up to the mountains. The multitude did not go up to the mountains with him. The multitude were in the valley because he had been speaking to them, preaching to them, teaching them, and doing all kinds of miracles. It is at the valley where the healings and the miracles and the breakthroughs we are happening. But on the mountain, not everybody 
was able to get to the mountain. The only people that went up to the mountain were the disciples alone. The multitude could not go to the mountain, could not climb. So they stayed at the valley. <clears throat> so when Jesus finishes whatever it is that he was doing, teaching his disciples, waiting on God, praying, when he comes down, I remember Matthew chapter 17, a young woman came with her son that had epileptic seizure. So he was at the valley. So, but the disciples of Jesus could not deal with the situation. So when Jesus came down from the mountain, The type of Christians we have today, they don't like mounting, they don't like separation, they don't like to put in the effort that is needed. So we have looked at this Christianity, this church thing, this religious thing, we just looked at it as if um, it is a side attraction. And because of that, we don't seem to take this issue very seriously. So we always look down on it. We always play with it. We always uh, discard it. We always um, handle it and relate with it the way that seems fit to us. But you see, and when he saw the multitude, he went up to the mountains. So the boys were separated from the men. So it was only the disciples that went up. In the ministry of Jesus Christ, there are different, there, is, there are ways he speak. He will speak to different people, different message for different people. When he comes to those of them who are interested in miracles and breakthroughs, he leaves them at the valley there. And he will feed them, and when he finishes, those of them that are going somewhere in life come separate themselves and get to the mountain. That is where they choose. In the mountain, they don't do miracles. There is no breakthrough. There is no open doors. But it is those of them that are in the mountain, that have gone to the mountain, they are the ones that are actually, when you talk about different makers in their society, in their generation. They are the world changers. When you talk about world changers, they are those of them that go to the mountain to meet with Jesus Christ, where they hear not about breakthroughs and healings and open doors and they're meeting your needs and stuff like that. They are not, that is not what they are. They go there to do. They go there to deal with weightier matters that are not meant for children. So what I'm about to share with you is not for, because you, if you are in the valley there, you are interested in your stomach, you are interested in just meeting your needs because you have yourself, you, are, you, are, you, you have so much pressing needs and all of that, then tonight is not for you. I want to give you some time so that you can carry your bag and Bible and go home. I'll give you 30 seconds. Okay. Verse 2, Matthew chapter 5. And he opened his mouth and taught them. He opened his mouth and began to teach them. Teaching. He wasn't preaching, teaching, precept upon precept, line upon line. He opened his mouth and began to teach. What he was teaching them here is called the, the Beatitudes. The be attitude, the attitude that you should have. The kind of attitude that you should, as a Christian, exhibit. This is a kind of attitude that makes 
the difference that distinguishes or separates the boys from the men in the kingdom. This should be your attitude. This should be your lifestyle. Another word for the beatitude is the mind of Christ. This is the mind of Christ. The beatitude or the beatitudes is called the mind of Christ. That is the kind of mind, the kind of attitude, the kind of lifestyle that Jesus Christ is a bit. And this is the kind of attitude that everyone that is found in the kingdom of God exhibits, both in heaven. If you go to heaven now, what you are going to see is the mind of Christ in it. Because the Bible says we have the mind of Christ. It is one thing for you to have the mind of Christ. Potentially, it is another thing for you to live in the mind of Christ, to express the mind of Christ. The B attitudes are those characters, the qualities, what makes, what differentiates you as a Christian from someone who is not a Christian, who is not born again. It's not for the boys, it's not for children. That's why he took them up there in the mountain. And so the first thing that he said, the first of those attitudes, I'm going to do the first and the third together for a reason I'm going to explain to you. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We are talking about blessing. God bless me. Who are those of them that are going to be blessed? What kind of people are going to be blessed? It's not just coming and say, God bless me. May God bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. It doesn't work like that, though. That's why I said this, this one is for, for those who eat bones, hard meat. The kind of people that are going to be blessed, he said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. They are the one that own. They are the one that have the kingdom of heaven. Those of them that are poor in the spirit. Okay, I will show you, tell you why I want to look at um, three and uh, the first and the third. Secondly, verse four. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. They that mourn, and they shall be comforted. We're going to take it one by one, but I'm very certain that there is no way I will be able to finish the nine of them. There are nine beatitudes, the beatitudes, the mind of Christ. There are nine of them. I'm not, I'm certainly, there's no way I'm going to finish it. But let me just go through. Verse uh, five, five, it says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and taste after righteousness, for they shall be filled. So, see the kind of people that are going to be blessed. See the quality of the people, the kind of people that are going to be blessed. Blessed are they merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God or the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. And he say in verse 12 he say rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Okay, so let's go to verse 2 or verse 3. Now, 
These are the Beatitudes, the kind of life, style, the kind of mind you must have. The first is, blessed are they poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The third one says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now look at poor in spirit. What does being poor in spirit mean? It means lowly in the heart. It means humility. That's the meaning of the word poor in the spirit. Poor in spirit means you are humble. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11 verse 28. All ye that labor and are heavy laden, come unto me and I will give you rest. Verse 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly. I am meek. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. I am lowly because I am humble. Jesus is meek. Jesus is humble. That's why I say I want to take the two together. What, does the, what is the difference between humble and meek? A humble person submits himself to a higher authority. A higher authority cannot humble himself to a lower person. The humble submits to the one that is greater, the one that is higher. And that is why you humble yourself before the almighty God. You humble yourself before your boss. You humble yourself before your leader. But if it is meek, a meek person is one that is of a higher authority coming down to relate with those of them that are beneath him from high to low and then humility is from low to high you submit to a higher authority and that's why the bible tells us to humble ourselves before god now to be humble He says, God says, he resists the pride and he gives grace to those of them that are humble, that are poor in the spirit, that are lowly. If you are not a humble person, if you do not surrender or submit yourself to the powers that be, to the authority, whether they are the ones that are directly under God or the ones that are ordained by God, you submit yourself to them. When you submit, when you surrender and submit to authority that is higher than you, what happens is that the grace, what you are saying is that you humble yourself, you acknowledge you are not superior to the person. You humble yourself and then grace will be released upon you. When you surrender and you are answerable to the authority that be, either in your office or wherever you are, you are submissive. You are not rebellious. You are not a proud person. You don't antagonize or criticize or fight your leader or fight those that are in authority. Because if you do, they are going to crush you. Because they have what it takes to remove you and to destroy you. So what happens is that when you surrender and submit yourself to them, what happens is that they will give you grace. They will help you. They will strengthen you. When it is time for them to show favor, they show favor to those of them that submit to them and not to those of them that fight them. You can't fight the authority that keeps you. And so when you don't have that spirit of 
humility, that lowly heart. At every point in time, you recognize your weakness. That is why I said that your weakness is a portal to the power of God. When you humble yourself under the almighty God, he will exalt you. He will lift you up. But when you are stubborn, you don't submit to God's authority. You don't submit to God's word. He will break you. He will crush you. So you see, Jesus Christ, he said, learn of me because I am meek and I am lowly. How is he lowly? How, how? Let's look at um, Philippians chapter 2 verse 5. Philippians 2 5, he said, let this mind be in you. That's why he said it is the mind, of, the beatitudes are called the mind of Christ. He said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Verse 5. Who being in the form of God, thought, not, thought it not robbly to be equal with God, but did what? He made himself of no reputation. You see those of them that are meek, he made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men, verse 8. And being found in fashion as a man, he did what? He humbled. He being found, um, being found in fashion as a man, as a man, what did he do? He humbled himself. He humbled himself to God. He surrendered himself to God. Go to verse 7. Verse, verse 6. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, in the form of God, high, mighty, okay, but made himself of no reputation, that is meekness. He made himself of no reputation. When he comes to authority, he is big and high and mighty. So, Jesus Christ was lowly in heart. He was meek at the same time. Submitting as a man, being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. And because he humbled himself, what happened? God exalted him. If you humble yourself, you will be exalted. And he went further to say, when you are meek, a meek man does not regard himself. He doesn't take, assume to be too important. He lives his life as a simple person, simplicity. If he enters here, you will not be able to identify that this man is who, is this or that. He doesn't carry the cloud. He doesn't carry all those um, paraphernalia and all of that and go in with him and stuff like that. When you see him, he is quite unassuming. That's a meek man. He's a power under control. He's not, he's not assuming, he's not assuming. You come before, if you, just like Jesus Christ, that is why he took the keys of Judas in order to identify who Jesus Christ was in the midst of his disciples. Because he was not assuming. There was no cloud around him. He was very simple. So you hardly be able to identify him when he is in the midst of his people. He will take somebody who has worked very closely with him to be able to identify that Jesus Christ, this is Jesus Christ. But what do we have today? Because in every, that is why if you begin to live a life of um, you know a lot of us, when you talk about meekness, give me, give me, let's look at um, 
for example, Romans chapter 12, verse 16. Romans 12, 16. Give me NLT. Give me NLT of Romans 12, 16. He said, live in harmony with each other. Do not be proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. Have you seen it? Do not be proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. And don't think you know it all. Give me NIV. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. This is what is me. Jesus Christ is telling you, I am lowly, I am meek. A meek person is non assuming. You see, because you as an individual, you hold these two. You can be meek and at the same time be humble. When you come in a place where you know that all these other people are low, are lower than you, you are better than them by every standard and all of that, you still want to exhibit your superiority. You still want to show them that you are so-so and so person, either by your dressing or by what you are driving or by what is driving you or by the cloud that you carry and all of that, so many of them. So by way of intimidation and all of that, you want to press them down in order to prove a point. Now, now I ask you a question. Can you imagine if there was a fuel queue and there is a very long queue and then the local government chairman comes, he wants to buy fuel. Where do you think, where do you think he's going to, what do you think he's going to do? Hmm? Straight to where? straight to will hook you up. Okay, be very honest. If Jesus Christ was to be around on earth today and there was a queue and then he comes to buy fuel, what do you think he will do? What do you think he will do? What do you think he will do? Are you sure? He will go to the back. Though he is the president, he will go to the back and queue up. That's meekness. That's what is called meekness. That's why, you see, it's not for babies. When you are, I'm going to show you something. When you talk about changing the society, doing national transformation, is a lot of things that are saying out there is just lip service. That is why till today nothing is happened. You are just you are just wasting your time and doing nothing. Because the one that is doing that national transformation or whatever, when it is time and all of that, you know what they, they will shunt, they will find a way and all of that and cut corners in order to get it. Because you are not showing an example to the other, but you are not meek. Meekness is that you are up there and then you come down. You obey the law. You don't, you don't, you don't subvert the law. You don't. But what do we have in the society today? What do we have among the church? I'm not even talking about the society. We're talking about the church, the body of Christ. Being meek. You are not above the law. You know the level of meekness of Jesus Christ was that he became obedient to men that he created. The spots in his face People that he created, he is a God, he is God himself. He created them. In the beginning was, was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. All things by, were made by him, and nothing was made that was made. He made everything. And then yet, look at what they were doing, to, and he kept quiet. They revived him, he didn't revive back. They threatened him, he didn't threaten back.
Why? Meek. He had the power to deal with them, but he didn't do that. And you see him, he associates with men of low estates. Lowly in heart. He submits to God. Everything that you hear him say, he say, my father, as I hear my father, so I do. He was subject to God. meekness learn of me Jesus said learn of me so what are you going to learn learn the mind of Christ learn his character this is the attitude that every of us should adopt blessed are the poor in the spirit, the ones that are humble, God will lift you, God will exalt you. The principle of success in the kingdom of God is different from the principle of success out there in the world. Only if we will sit down and learn Christ and be taught of him to be humble, to be meek. You know why the meekness? Because a meek person comes in the midst of the people of his subject. He humbles himself. I mean, he, he, he's not assuming. He is there to relate with them. He carries them along. And all of that. And so, because somebody said, no one know, want to know how much you know until they know how much you care. Because this guy is down to X before his own subject. Do you know what will happen to his subject? The subject will fall in love with him. They will want to help him. They will want to be there. And that is the reason why anytime T, because those of us who are in authority, who are in leadership and all of that, you carry yourself and say you are a positional leader and all of that. And that's why you are calling people to do X, Y, Z. Nobody is answering you. The reason is because you are not yet humble and you are not meek. You are not humble to the one that put you there. You are not humble to the authority. You think you are. Because the, evi the evidence to show, to prove that you are humble to the authority that put you there is when you go back to your subject, you tell this one, come. You call for them to come. They will not come. The reason why they will not come is because you are not sur submitting to your authority. You rebel in your heart. By the things you think and by the things you say and by the things you do. And that is why they will not answer you. And then you start complaining that these people are this and that. It is actually you are. Opening up yourself the way you are. This is who you are. So if you are sitting down there and you criticize the leader, you criticize the pastor, you rebel, they say do this, you don't do that, you walk away, you do. You already have what you want to do in your mind and in your heart. You just set up doing it. There's no problem. I may not even know, I may know, I may not know. It doesn't bother me and all of that. But you find out that when you are in a place where you have other people under you, no one is answering you, no one will submit to you, no one will respect you, no one. And you keep on, that is where you stay there forever and ever. Nothing is happening. Because these are spiritual laws and principles. Because you are not subject to the higher powers. I'm talking about in the kingdom. In the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God. And so when you talk about humility, you submit the authority that is higher than you. And when you talk about meekness, the authority 
comes down to the level they become people inclusiveness they have inclusive they carry the people along they talk with them they they hear they listen to them they carry them along they are compassionate they they they, they are interested in the people he doesn't go and set himself high up there Once you enter a church and all of that, you already know who is a set man, who is a pastor, and who is a geo, and who is this, and who is that. You know, you just know. And then you see who is the first lady in the church, the pastor's wife. Because you must wear gold. And wear big. And then the car, you see the car park, where the, it's evident. I want to say this. You may not like it, but that is the truth. You see, everything that you are doing in this world, your money, your business, your education, your certificate, your qualifications, and everything, they stink. They don't make any, they don't hold water at all. You don't need any of those things in order to impact the kingdom of God. This is the requirement that God is looking for. Those who are meek, those who are humble in heart. What did he say concerning? Give me First Peter chapter three verse seven. You know what he said? Give me First Peter three seven. Likewise, you husband dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor to. Give me verse four. But let it be the hidden man of the heart in, the, in that which is not corruptible. Even the ornament of what? Meek and what? Quiet spirit. Another word for quiet spirit is lowliness, a lowly heart, humble heart, humble spirit. He said, because a, of a meek and quiet spirit, which is what? In the sight of God, what? Great prize. So a lot of people can have all the money, have all the everything going for them. I mean Christians. But they don't have this, which is of great price before God, which is a rare pearl or gem in the sight of God, which is what God values more than any other thing. It's the same thing that he's still talking about. Meek and quiet spirit. Meek and lowly heart. Meek and poverty of the spirit, poor in the spirit. If you lay hold on it, you are made in life. You are made in life. You are made. He said, because blessed is he who is blessed that they who are poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom that we are talking about. It belongs to them. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit. Because people will be there to help you. Not the type that they do. Not the, not the fake, adulterated meekness and all of that. They are now running up, running up and down. When it is time for politics, for election and all of that, they start buying um, uh, uh, a mudu of gari and rice and all of that and then spreading to the people. And then they will be going to the villages and all of that, giving people, hungry people and all of that. And then you see the masses and all of that following it. That is fake. You go and borrow and buy a crowd to vote for you. And that is why when you finally, when they, when they, when they deceive the populace, they will vote them into power. Once they enter there, You can't hear from them again. You can't visit them. You can't. They do whatever they want. And what is it? They've, got, they've gotten what they wanted from you. Your vote so that they can be there. And they keep amassing wealth and enriching themselves. They don't care about whatever it is that you think you're doing. It should not be so with us in the kingdom of God. See, we are the ones that are keeping ourselves down. 
in this. Meekness, power under control. Lowly spirit, a lowly heart, a humble heart. Submit. Whether you are right, whether you are right or you are not right, whether you are correct or not correct, whether your leader is right or not right, Challenging your leader, telling your leader that what he's doing is wrong, and that you have the audacity, you open your mouth and you say it. He's proud. He's pride. It doesn't go well. I know of a man, you know, you know him in in the those days you know the one that pastor will be preaching he will write a note and his pastor is preaching he will write a note the pastor should try and do quick and come down that he has a revelation he has something to to share yeah you are doing like we have many of them here your own might not be right because if you are given the opportunity to write something and give pastor and give, uh, he will do it. Because you feel you know, you know better, you know as you know better than your pastor, you know better than your teacher. That's what you think you do. They call you and say, you come and share the word. He say, come and share for, for 10 minutes. You collect 30 minutes. Because you have so much you want to explore. Revelations. You are not humble. You are proud. Proud. I see them every time. Five minutes, five minutes is five minutes. Five minutes, we didn't say 5.5 minutes. You don't do that, he's proud. You want to prove that you know more. That's what is in their heart. Promotion does not come. And when I mean promotion, in every area of your life. Because you are in the kingdom. What is obtainable in this kingdom? This is how the kingdom operates. These are the people that are blessed. Blessed are they that are meek. Blessed are they meek, for they shall inherit. Blessed are they that are poor in the spirit, for they shall, they, for theirs is a kingdom. You see the blessedness, the people that are blessed. Did you see people who are, in all these things that we read, the B attitude, the nine of them, did you see anyone that is, he said, blessed are those that work hard? Eh? That work hard. Have you, did you see it here? Did you see it here? So why is it not included? The race is not to the swift. Bread is not to the wise. Skill is not to the favored. Because time and chance, they happen to them all. There are mysteries. There are mysteries in the kingdom, and that is what we are talking about. There are secrets. There are depths. Because if you want to look at your life the way the world is looking at it, and all that, and you're a member of the kingdom of God, you are going to be frustrated for the rest of your life. And I will wish, and I will advise you, Leave the kingdom, go into the kingdom of the world, then adopt that their sister. You will succeed, definitely, because they are succeeding. Of course, you know there is a good success. There is a bad success. So follow them. Blessed are the poor in the spirit. Blessed are the meek. Let's look at the second. 
Blessed are they that mourn. For they shall be comforted. Comfort. Many of you want a comfortable life. You want your life to be comfortable. It comes by mourning. Blessed are they that mourn. What does it mean to mourn? You mourn for losses? When you lose something, you mourn. Now, when we talk about mourning, mourning, why do we need to mourn sorrow upon sorrow? Give me Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 1. A good name is better than precious ointment. These are nuggets. These are eternal truths. These things are very deep. The price of holding on to a good name is a lot. It is not meant for children and babies in the kingdom. Those who are after their belly, those who are after blessings and breakthroughs and open door, you can't get this. Blessed, a good name is better than the precious ointment, and the day of death is better than the day of war. <clears throat> How many of you are celebrating your birthday? You celebrate birthday, you don't celebrate death, death day. Have you seen it? Your death, the death is better than the birth. Because at birth is rejoicing and rejoicing. You are remembering your 80th year, 80th birthday. And you, you are cooking food and eating and drinking and playing music all over. Merry, merriment is very destructive to a soul that wants to live for Christ. Merriment. Partying. A good name is better than the precious ointment, and the day of death than the day of one's birth. You know, there are people who have separated and divorced and are quarreling and living like cat and dog in their home, in their marriage, because the mother, the wife did not... Um, the husband did not celebrate or remember they get the wife's birthday. And you see, they are, all these things are aliens. They, they started borrowing it and bringing it into the kingdom of God. The, the pastor's birthday, in the pastor's birthday, the whole church will come down. They will shut down everything. They will mobilize. They will do party. They will raise money. They will buy him a car. They will buy him a house. They will do all that. Everything. The bad day of the pastor has come. Where did we learn this thing? Where did we borrow them from? The world. That's why you don't see me. When you post your bed and I don't answer you, I don't say anything. I want to see the day I will answer you is when you post the day, what will happen in the day you die. Before you die, this is and this and that and that is what I would have wanted to accomplish. I want to, I want to be remembered for this and all of that when I die. And hey, that's the one I will answer you. Celebrate with me, this is my birthday. You go to Facebook, nobody, Instagram, everywhere, you block, buy everything. You travel abroad to celebrate your birthday. Don't, you won't, because nobody will tell you. I say it's carnality to the highest order. Such people don't mount anything in the kingdom of... I'm telling you the truth. It's in the Bible. Verse 2. 
It is better to go to the house of what? Mourning, where you mourn, than to go to the house of feasting. So what do you do? You have a morning to go to attend. You have a feast, a wedding coming on. You have it somewhere somebody just died. Where will you go? Which one do you prefer? Eh? Be very honest. Stop lying. Where will you go to? Where they are doing party. Where there is wedding. Where there is a big ceremony. So and so people are coming and all of that. But then on this other side where they are crying and mourning and wailing. You won't want to go there. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For that is the end of all men. And the living will lay it to what? To heart. The living will lay it to heart when they go to a place of mourning. Because that is the end of every man. So when you go there, you see, you have a reflection of your life. However, in this day and age that we are in, we don't think about that. A house of money now has become a house of party and merriment. A house of mourning is now a house of party. And I'm talking about the church, the body of Christ. Somebody just died now. You go and put him in the, put him in the mortuary for the next two, three weeks and one month. And then what are you doing? Preparing and making arrangements. And some people are sewing different, um, different um, ashebis and different whatever. All kinds of things. I have been to a place where they are burying somebody and all of that. You will not be able to know the difference between where they are doing celebration, um, um, uh, wedding ceremony or whatever, or fala festival, whatever it is, and the burial. They everything. You... I'm telling you, even in the mortuary, when you go, I mean burial ground, when you go to where they are burying people and all of that, the things are no more there. I saw one day, it was the day I went to bury, bury um, 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 Ibuku's auntie. Is he auntie or God? I don't know. My eyes saw my ears that day. What they were doing with a corpse, a dead body in a, in, a, in a coffin. What they were doing with it. So no mourning. And they are Christians. They are born again. So where is the morning? How can you now be blessed? The blessedness that comes from morning is gone. Because people don't mourn again. He said it is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For that is the end of all men. And the living will lay it to heart. They don't lay to heart again. Once they finish the whatever and all of that, there is a refreshment and all of that. The guests will refresh the guests and this group of guests and then this group of guests and then so many. Is party will start. Eating and drinking in a burial ground. Where there's supposed to be mourning. Verse 3. <clears throat> Sorrow is better than what? Have you seen it? Sorrow is better than what? You don't want to say it, and I first saw I don't like this kind of preaching to change, to change, to change, to change, to change. That's why I said it is not for boys. It's what Jesus Christ was teaching them at the mountain. The disciples, they followed him up there. I will show you something. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by the sadness of the heart, ha, 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 the ha, countenance ha. of the heart is made better. Hey, Jehovah, sorrow 
is better than laughter. I'm not the one that wrote. That is why if you are coming to church, you must carry your Bible. You see this kind of generation that, and I am against it. I hate it the way God hates sin. Nothing can replace this Bible. No matter what, no matter how sophisticated that your, that your gadget is, it can never take this place, the place of this book. It's called the holy book. You must read it. If you want to be blessed, I'm talking about being blessed by God, then you must read this. You must live this life. This is the mind. Let this mind be in you as it was also in Christ. Lowly heart, meek heart, Jesus mourn. Sorrow is better than the laughter, for by the sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. Verse 4. The heart of the wise is in the house of where? Have you seen it? Morning. The heart of the, the heart of the wise is in the house of morning. But the heart of fools is where? Is where? Where they are doing is party. That's why somebody will live, will sleep in the night. Then early in the morning he will wake up. Or he or she wakes up from the bed, then enters his or her bathroom, have a bath, then wear his or her clothes, then enters a car and tells the driver to drive him or her to the airport. Where are you going to? I'm going to Cuba. I'm going to. The choice is yours. I don't know what he wants in life. These are the words of Jesus Christ. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of the fools is in the house of men, where there is enjoyment and party. Enjoyment. Her pastor, there won't be prayer meeting today. Why? Because today is Christmas. It's a celebration day. Really? Verse 5. It is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of fools. Okay. Give me Second Corinthians chapter seven. Second Corinthians seven nine. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to what? Repentance. For you were made sorry after a godly manner, that you might receive damage by us in nothing. Verse ten. For godly sorrow. Walk at repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world walk at death. The sorrow of the world brings death. The sorrow, a godly sorrow, brings repentance and salvation and life. It's a blessed life. You know why? When someone, for example, dies, who oh, cry and cry and cry. I have seen it over and over and over and over. This one was just crying and crying uncontrollably. As he was crying, yeah, I watched them. I, when I go, I watched them. He will cry and cry and cry. And then he now goes somewhere and now sit down. You think he's reflecting on the person that is dead and all of that. One day I was, in my whatever, he said, my son, come up. 
my son will come. Nobody has answered me. Or they've not given me anything. I say, what is it? He say, don't you have a stout? I say, there's no stout. He say, what about, uh, if you see the, the kind of drink that he's calling, he came to somebody that just finished crying. <clears throat> That's what they do. After that, the next, <coughs> excuse me, the next minute they walk away as if nothing happened. If you see, they, they don't even regard death as anything. Death doesn't mean anything at all. See the generation that we have here, they are cutting people, say they are using human beings for rituals and doing all kinds of things. It doesn't matter to them anymore. It's the generation that you and I are. They just cry for that moment. Even, even if when you lose a loved one and all of that, you just cry and cry and cry. You think that cry is going to produce a different person? No. After that, business as usual continues. But he said, godly sorrow. When such a thing happens, those of us who are saying godly, sorrow means mourn. You sorrow or you mourn or you grieve. Over things. Another aspect of sorrow or grief, give me, give me, is called a broken heart. It's called a contract spirit. Give me um, Psalm 51, verse 17. <clears throat> Excuse me. The sacrifices of God, I give me verse 16. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else will I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering, verse 17. He said, the sacrifices of God are what? A broken spirit. A broken and a contrite heart. Oh God, thou will not despise. When you sin, what was happening here? David was mourning. He was mourning for the sin that he committed. When we sin, we mourn. Why do you mourn? You mourn because you have sinned against a holy God. You have sinned against his holy commandments. It's not something that you just sweep under the carpet. I cover myself with the blood of Jesus Christ. When you lie, you must mourn. When you tell somebody that you are coming by 10 and you didn't come by 10, that is a lie. You must be a man and a woman of integrity. Keep to your word. He that sweareth to his own heart and changeth not. Because that is how you will change. If you don't do that, you will not. Next day you will lie again and you will not repent. Next day you give somebody appointment and you break it and nothing will happen. You keep on as if to say God is like that. God is not like that. His words are yea and amen. If you want to follow Christ, he said, follow Christ. Look unto him. Follow his footsteps. This man, his words are not, he didn't say, he will not say one thing and do another one. He won't give you his word and then just like you come to church late and you are normal. One minute late you come here, you are sinned against God. You should mourn. Whatever it is that there's no other place that is most and more important than in the presence of if you have an appointment with God. We are talking about those who are going to be blessed by God. These are the things that have been eroded and taken away from the church and the, from the body of God. Nobody ever talks about it doesn't hold water in the church anymore. So you can live any way you want to live. You can do whatever you want to do. Live your life the way you want. You live according to this book. This is a mirror. As we behold it with an open face as in a mirror. Just like you get a mirror, you, you have your bath and all of that. Then you stand in front of the mirror. You are brushing your teeth. You are putting the pancake and all of that on your face. You are looking at yourself on the mirror. In order to identify the areas that you need to add or remove, or clean, and all of that. It's a mirror that shows you that's what the word of God should be like to you. It should be a pattern of your life. Read it and then practice what you read. Uh, 
Hello? You know, I told you it's not for children. Mm -mm. What we have been in the church over the years is sucking breast milk. Sucking breasts. Are you not tired? Eating the same kind of food every year. You are used to it. Give us manna. The, this cucumber and melon and, and garlic and uh, carrot. And, see the kind of, they are tasteless things. So they are, and they are used to it. Take us back to Egypt. Because they saw giants. Broken spirit. I do something that is bad. I mourn. I weep. I cry. I sorrow. I grieve. I go to God. On my knees, I cry to him. I did this to you. Help me. If you have this kind of mindset, attitude, if this kind of mind is in you, it will, it will be, you will be breaking through, breaking even. Your spiritual progress will be, you, you will be adding every day. You will be growing. You will, not, you will not be found doing the same thing, struggling. Struggling with the certain sin. Lies. Because to you, it's nothing. Yeah, I told you I will come by 3 o'clock. I came by 3.30. Yeah, didn't I? But I have I've come now. So let's move on. Uh -uh. You can't tell God that. Remember the person you are dealing with. That's why anything that you are do it with purpose, consciousness, define what it is that you want. If it is this God, know this God. Find that he kind of a person. And then so that you'll be able to walk with him. Not everybody can walk. We can live in the spirit and live with him, but we can't walk with him. That's why the Bible says, if we live in the spirit, let us walk. If we don't make this adjust, this is the, the salmon on the mouth, the bee attitudes, the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. Let this mind be in you as it was also in Christ. Cultivate it. Walk on it. Don't sweep it under the carpet. Hey, remember again, when you read this Bible, Jesus Christ he is coming to take a church without spot, without blameless. He's coming to meet you blameless. Do you have it in front of your mind? Are you working with that? With that kind of mindset? That is coming to take you without spot, without blameless. No blame found in you. That is the kind of person he's coming to pick. True or false? Then are we working with that kind of mindset? You know, we are born again. Once you are born again, you are eternalist. Anyway, let me not let me not go there. Because it will make me angry. Blessed. Are they poor in spirit? How can a poor, humble person be blessed? Blessed are they that mourn. How can someone mourning be blessed? Blessed are they meek. And they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they that hunger. That's the next. Blessed are they that hunger and taste.
What is a hunger and a test? What are you? What is your hunger? What are you tasting for? What is your passion? What you are you driving at? Righteousness is different from good. You can do something that is good, but it's not right. You can do something that is good, but it is not the right thing. You can be in a good place, but at the wrong time. When we talk about righteousness, you know, a lot of people, they, this is what they have used to destroy the body of Christ. They tell you that once you are saved, you have received the righteousness of God. For he who knew no sin was made sin, that we might become the righteousness of God, of God in Christ. And say, I am the righteousness of God, I am the righteousness of God. And there is nothing you did in order to get it. And there is nothing you can do to keep it. So once you get it, you get it, and that is it. Hey. Hey. So that is why they tell you that even if you are lying, there is nothing wrong about you. You are seeing the righteousness of God. Even if you are cheating, you are seeing the righteousness of God. Even if you are cutting corners, you are seeing the righteousness. Even if you are stealing money from the God, stealing everywhere, you see, you are seeing the righteousness of God. Is how Christ, is it how Christ is? Half truth. Just like half education is dangerous, half truth is also very dangerous. Give me Titus chapter 1, verse Titus 1 1. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after what? Which is after what? There are truths that they are not after godliness. Just like you are the righteousness of God in Christ. And so because you are the righteousness of God in Christ, there is nothing that you did in order to inherit it or in order to get it, and there is nothing you can do in order to keep it. It's a gift. It's imparted. Jesus paid for it. And so it has been bequeathed to you. You are now the righteousness of God in Christ. Yes. And after that. So that is why you can sin. They are sleeping around. They are committing immorality. They are, they are lying. They are committing fornication and adultery and all kinds of things. And they are right because they are the tree of righteousness. Because they are the righteousness of God. Because they have received Christ. And he has made them righteous. So there's nothing you can do about it. It's a lie. Most, um, John the Baptist said to them, if you have repented, bring the evidence of your repentance. Meet to show that you are a changed man. You cannot receive life of Christ and you are living in sin. No. The Bible says if anyone that has the seed of God cannot sin. Blessed are they that hunger and taste after righteousness. Do you taste for righteousness? You know, to hunger and taste is what you find when you fast and you pray. You want to wait on God. You know what we normally do when you say you want to go for retreat? You want to hear from God. You want to go and hear from God. Hear what? Hear what? I don't know where we get some things that we are talking and we are doing. We've been brainwashed. And there really is religion. And that is why at the end of the day, 
at the end, you see, I was telling them in Ikota last Sunday, I said, it's not a, I don't want a situation, you just stand in the pulpit, you are preaching and you are talking year in, year out, every month and all of that. I want to see result. These people that have been talking to, are they changing? Are they becoming like Christ? In their character, in their attitude. If they are not changing, then I'm wasting my time. Because somebody who is doing business, you go out there, you are, you are doing business and all of that, you are going to be checking whether there is profit coming in or not. Not to just be organizing, organizing holding church services and all of that, holding meetings and programs and at the end of the day. What about the life of the people? Are they changing? Are they becoming like Jesus Christ? Because the kingdom of God essentially is about righteousness. You must live it. It's about what you do and how you do it. You can't just be living your life and you, you say, he said, those of them that are blessed, he said, you go to fast, you go to pray, you go to wait on God. When I go to my prayer cross, I want to wait on God. I want to fast, Lord, that I may know you. I want to be like Jesus Christ. I want to talk like him. I want to behave like him. I want to think like him. I want to see things like him. I want my life to be like Christ. So that when people see Fred, they have seen you, Lord. This is my cry. That I may be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm.